I'm Sean Kankade. Thanks for having me here. Uh, and thanks to the organizers. It was a fun day. And thanks to Elad for hosting me. Uh, it's always good to be back in Israel and see so many friends uh, and an ever-growing set of friends. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so part of the reason we're here today is really the remarkable progress we've made in the last few years uh, empirically in areas like vision, speech, and NLP, right? Like in speech recognition, what was the state of the art a few years ago? Basically, you could say your credit card number into a clean phone line, and it could understand, basically understand you're saying one of 10 digits, uh, and usually gets it wrong. And three years later, it understands people in different accents in pretty noisy environments, and you know, saying a word out of tens of thousands of words in a language. And one of the hallmarks in this progress is that many of these algorithms are essentially getting at intermediate representations of data. Okay? And, and the excitement is they actually seem to be learning real representations. So there's this recent paper by uh, Rob Fergus and Matt Zeiler on the deep learning literature for computer vision. If you don't believe me, look at this paper. It's stunning to see the, the types of filters they're learning. Uh, it, it's not like some gobbledygook are in these networks. They're really learning representations of data. And the question we're going to ask is, how do we actually understand how we learn representations of data? And let's start simple with two abstractions. OK, so what are uh, the two simplest models for getting at latent variables models, or models where there are hidden states. Okay, so two natural models are these topic models where you see a document and your document, we'll just ignore the word order, we'll consider the document to be a collection of words, and we think there are a few different types of topics in the world, like sports, science, politics, uh, maybe hundreds to thousands of these, and every document is about, basically contains a small number of topics. Okay, and the learning problem is we have a collection of documents, and we'd like to figure out the topics. And no one's told, out what the to told us what the topics are. Okay, so there's also this uh, mixture of Gaussian's problem. We see a bunch of points in space, and our goal is to estimate the means of each of these clusters. Okay, so hopefully people are familiar with this. And the question is, how do you learn these models? Okay, so what you're going to be given is just a collection of documents. Give me back the topics. Okay, so how do you do that? And there's certainly been a lot of work, both practically and theoretically, on this problem in the last few years. So in practice, people do mostly iterative-based approaches and sometimes sampling-based approaches. And they're usually local search heuristics. And there's various reasons that people think these problems are NP-hard. Okay? And, and that's the, the question we, w we want to address. How do you, how do you learn these? Yeah, these questions definitely interrupt me and ask during the talk. Okay. So, in this talk, uh, we're going to try to shed some light on what's going on and basically provide a closed form estimation procedure for these models. And it turns out the estimating these models, it, it's not an NP hard problem, uh, which is a little surprising because it, it seems like these guessing games might be because they aren't convex, yet we can still estimate them. And to some extent, we do this because we rely on some linear algebra tools. Like the SVD is this procedure, which is sort of our favorite non-convex optimization procedure. Uh, you can't formulate it jointly. It's a convex optimization problem. And this set of tools really is applicable to a wider variety of problems, like LDA, HMMs. Uh, and it's sort of seeing increasing traction. OK, so let's just start simple define these models, and then go through things slowly to give some intuition for why it's actually not so difficult to learn these things. OK, so let's start with the single topic model. So forget about topics having multiple, uh, forget about documents having multiple topics. OK, so let's just say every document has one topic. How do we sample the words in the document? OK, so just for, for uh, notation, say there are k topics in the world, and there are d words in our language. Okay, and how do we sample a document? Well, first we're going to randomly pick a topic, so there's some distribution over topics. Okay. And then we're going to sample m words independently from the same topic. 
Okay? So the, the key point is every word is sample independent from the topic. So we're ignoring the word order in our document, we're just treating it like a, you know, a bag of words. We sample each word independently. And, and then our data set consists of multiple documents. Okay, and for convenience, it's often natural to think of our words as binary vectors. So they're just a vector of a bunch of zeros, and you put an entry uh, and at the position at which the word occurred. Okay, so these are sometimes called hot encoding. So this says, you know, like the second word in our language occurred. So x1 is going to be, we're going to de denote that as the first word in our document. Okay, so is that notation clear? So this notation is handy because we, we like to think of our topics as vectors. You can just literally think of the topic as specifying a distribution over words, and the, the topic vectors mu and mu k are just vectors of length d because there are d words in, a voca in our vocabulary. So we good with, the, good with that? Okay, so again, here's your problem. I'm going to give you a set of documents. I'm going to tell you Every document was generated according to one hidden topic. I don't tell you the topics, and I say, tell me uh, what the, the di these distributions are. Tell me what the mu's are. And, and once you have that, it's easy enough to figure out what the w and the wk are. Okay, so this is just the, the probability of each topic. Okay, so uh, it's nice to look at this side by side with the mixture of Gaussians problem, because you can think of a topic model a lot like a discrete version of of basically a clustering model. Okay, so in the mixture of Gaussian problem, I'm going to essentially overload notation because these models are very similar. So in the mixture of Gaussian's problem, think of having k means mu n to mu k. So these are, again, just points in space. And now how do we sample a point? Well, first we decide which mean we're going to get up at the top. And then we add noise to that. So what you see is some mean corrupted with noise. And the mean is sampled with probability wi. And so what we observe, each point is some hidden mu i plus noise. So now our data set is a bunch of points. And I give you this bunch of points. And here you can you know, view it like a point cloud. And I tell you, uh, I, I give you this, and I say, what are the means? In the mixture of Gaussian's case, I might ask you what the variances are too. So, so in, you know, we could have, there's a bunch of different cases here. But for now, assume the, the means are spherical. Okay. So the questions about notation? Actually, when I was uh, coming in the country, they asked to see my talk. And so I brought it out. And then he asked me what this figure was. And I told him it was a bunch of points. Uh, he seemed a little annoyed. Uh, OK. But they let me in. OK. So all right. OK, so now let's just set up the estimation problem. OK, so we have, the, uh, we have a notation now. And we're going to think about this through a very old lens called the method of moments. So this was actually due to Pearson. Uh, it preceded maximum likelihood estimation. And the idea was very intuitive. Uh, what you get is some data. You measure some averages of your data. You can estimate various quantities, like the means, variances. And the idea of the method of moments is to find parameters in your model which are consistent with the moments you observe in the data. Right? So it's like, you know, I see a bunch of data, I measure a bunch of averages, and I say, what parameters in my model are consistent with the averages I see in my data? Okay? And so it's a very intuitive procedure. So sometimes uh, solving this is called uh, you know, the inverse moment problem, and it's studied quite a bit in mathematics. Okay, so in our setting, it's a, it's a pretty natural question. So in the mixture of Gaussian's problem, the first moment is just the mean of our data. The second moment is basically telling us the ways in which our, our data vary jointly. So it's, this, it's a matrix. The third moment is a tensor. Uh, it's of size d cubed. It's sort of telling us ways in which the data vary in three directions simultaneously. Because the to topic models the moments take a very natural form. You can think of the first moment as just the unconditional distribution of words in your document. Okay, so, so it's just, the first moment is literally just what's the probability of some word? That's what it specifies. The second moment is going to be specified by 
the probability, the joint probability of two words. Okay, so like what's the chance that Riemann and geometry occur in the same document? Okay, that is going to be specified by the second moment. And the third moment is going to be specified by the distribution over trigrams. Okay, so it's the distribution of three words in your document. Okay, so the inverse moments problem is I'm just going to give you these moments, some set of moments, I'm going to give you them exactly. Let's just forget about sample complexity issues for a moment. Let's just say I gave you a few different moments and I said, tell me what the parameters are. Okay. And you, you should immediately say that you have an identifiability problem because I could just give you, you know, the average uh, you know, the first moment, and, you know, this is the, di the distribution over words in the language, and I say, here's, you know, this average distribution of words in your document, and I say, tell me the topics. You'd be like, you're crazy, I can't, it's not identifiable. It's the same thing with the mixture of Gaussians. I can say, here's the mean of all your data, tell me the means, and you can't, because you just, you know, it's just not identifiable with that information. So, the first question is just, with exact moments, what order of the moment suffices to identify the problem? And for the topic modeling case, it's kind of a cool question because it's essentially the same question of how long do documents need to be before the problem is in, even identifiable, right? Because suppose every document contained one word in it. All you could estimate is the average distribution over the words, and clearly if every document contained one word in it, you can't learn topics. Okay, so the mathematical question here is just, for the topic model case, is just how many words in a document do I need to have before I can even address the identifiability question? And if we can't even do that, learning is hopeless. Right? This is, it, it seems a pretty basic question. And it's, it's sort of not obvious, like is two words enough to figure out the topics? Three? It's, it wasn't immediately obvious. Okay, and then the hope is once we can address this identifiability issue, maybe it'll help us with algorithmic questions for solving this, this problem. So part of the, the talk is we're just going to look at these moments, look at the structure in them. So this, in a sense, is honest. We're just going to say what are the means and variances and distributions of the trigrams under these models. They're going to have a particular structure, and we're going to try to see if we can manipulate the structure. Okay, so we good with the, the setting? Questions? Okay, good. So, so bear with me. So let's just start. Let's look at the first moment. Okay, sorry. Related work. There's certainly been a ton of related work. Uh, this work actually, you know, everything has a history. Probably we were most influenced by a line of work by Joseph Chang, uh, and that work kind of influenced some work by uh, Elhanan and Sebastian. Uh, on phylogeny trees and HMMs, uh, and, and they basically were looking at algebraic techniques to address some of these problems. But uh, in a sense, some of the ideas here are actually very old, and at some level, the ICA community knew this stuff in the 70s, so if they really attacked these problems, they should have solved this a long time ago. Uh, but somehow, communities are just different. Uh, okay, so uh, the first moment. Let's start with the first moment. What does it look like? And it's going to be nice to look at these two models side by side, because the mixture of Gaussian's problem and the topic model, because they're very similar, uh, but we'll see differences between the two. OK, so the mixture of Gaussian's problem, what's the first moment? Well, it's just the mean of the data. Right? So these mu's are vectors. The first moment is just the sum of wi mu i. Okay, so W is a scalar. So it's literally just the average of where the data live. Okay. What's the first moment in the topic model case? It's just, again, the sum of W i's mu i's. So because again, we're thinking of these topics mu i's as, you know, it's a vector, but it's a probability distribution. So the vector sums to one and is positive. And the first moment, which is just the average distribution of words in the language, is the average of these vectors. Okay, we good with that? Okay, obviously, if I tell you this exactly and I say, tell me the topics, you can't. Just parameter counting suggests we don't have enough numbers. Because we basically want to estimate something like d squared numbers, and we're only getting d numbers out of this. Okay? So what about the second moment? Because here's where things get a little interesting, because now 
at least these two models start looking different from each other. Okay, so in the mixture of Gaussians problem, we're looking at basically you know, how the data vary with respect to each other. And if you think about it, there's really two ways, in, there's sort of two contributions for how the data vary. One is due to the fact you know, that the means are in different positions, so your data is varying just due to the fact uh, you, know, you have means in different locations. And then it, you also have a contribution to the second moment due to the fact you have noise. So let's just assume we have spherical noise for the, at the moment. Right, so the second moment looks like you know, this mu-mu transpose matrix, which is sort of how the means relate to each other, plus some contribution due to the fact that we have noise in our problem. Okay, is that at least intuitively clear? Yep. So you're assuming that the sample in the top modern case, you're assuming the sample is in the same uh, document again and again. Okay, so, so I haven't gone to the, so that's just the mixture of Gaussian's problem. Th that thing. Okay, so now let's go to your, the topic modeling case. So the, in the, in the, doc, yeah, in the topic modeling case, uh, we're going to assume we have m words in the document. Okay, and in the single topic case, every word is, join, is drawn independently under the same topic. Okay, so, there's, so this identifiability question is, you know, I mean, we are drawing multiple words in the same document, but that's related to the identifiability question because, uh, so to do this, we need two words per document to estimate the second moment. Okay, so, and because they're drawn independently, what does, so we can think about the joint distribution over two words in a doc document as a matrix where the i, j -th entry is the probability that word i and word j co-occur in the same document. That has the simple form of just the sum over mu mu transpose because every word is drawn independently. And that's very nice because we didn't have that in the mixture of Gaussian problem because, because of this, because of the noise. So, so this is one difference. Uh, but is this clear? The, and, and this is a nice, uh, you know, a nice difference. Okay, it turns out it's not identifiable. Uh, actually, I think Joseph Chang in his, his paper gave an example, uh, and so did Elhanan. Uh, but, you know, what's, what's the rank of this matrix? It's basically D because our data vary in all directions. But what's the rank of this bigram matrix? Yeah, it's no more than k because there's only k topics uh, and the, the words are sampled independently. Okay, so the first thing we see in the second moment, it's nice because we have a low rank matrix. So immediately we're getting at some of the structure in our data because this matrix is of size uh, d by d, yet it's a, a rank k matrix. OK? So, so again, we, you know, I give you these exactly, and I say, can you reverse engineer these parameters? And it turns out there are many solutions to this. And, and not like some theory thing. They really are degenerate. There, there's, there's kind of uncountably many models consistent with, with these statistics, even constraining things to be in the simplex and so on. Okay. Uh -huh. So you just don't have enough information looking at bigram statistics to, to get the topics. Okay, but you can see where we're gonna, we're gonna go, uh, the talk will end, but let's look at the third moment. Okay, and for now let's just drop the mixture of Gaussian's model because we see it's getting to be a headache because you know, every higher moment we're gonna have to have these noise contributions, it's gonna mix everything up. Uh, the single topic model super clean, so what does the third moment look like in the single topic model? Right, it's a sum over mu, mu, mu. Right. It's a sum over these guys. Uh, and, and the intuition is clear. What is you know, mu, 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 i, mu, i, mu, i? It's, it's a, as if you're sampling each word from the same topic. Right? If every document had one topic in it, the distribution of our words is just mu i, mu i, mu i. And I'm just doing a weighted sum over these w's. Again, and what's the size of this object? Like how many numbers are in my tensor here, or in my table of numbers? D cubed, right? Because I'm specifying the probability of word i, j, word i, j, and k co-occurring. 
So this is a tensor, but just think about it as a table of d cubed numbers. Okay. And in a sense, we've really just reduced this to a math problem now, right? I, I'm going to just tell you, here's a set of d squared numbers, this matrix M2. Here's a set of d cubed numbers, this tensor M3. And I'm going to tell you this matrix has this particular form. And I'm going to tell you this tensor has this particular form. Tell me what the mu is, mu's are, or tell me if it's identifiable or not. So you can just forget about even where this came from. This is just a math question now. Okay. This is really what it boils down to. And if we could address this positively, it tells us that three words are, in fact, sufficient to estimate this model. It doesn't yet tell us about an algorithm, uh, but there's a lot of structure. And parameter counting definitely isn't a favor at this point, because we've overkilled it. We've got d cubed numbers here. OK, so are we good with this? Questions? Is it clear? OK, so, so let's see how to estimate this. Uh, it's especially not so bad. So this first observation that this matrix is low rank, you know, what's the thing we like to do on matrices? Let's just do an SVD transform our coordinates to make it look like the identity matrix. So just make it white. Okay, so, so we can basically take, so, and since it's rank k, you can think of this as a dimensionality reduction step, uh, which is often done in practice. We're just going to take all of our words and embed, this, embed them in a k-dimensional space. Okay, so then we basically reduced the problem to having a k by k matrix, which looks like the identity, and then we have a k cube set of numbers, which has this form, because we really just done a linear transformation. Okay, but when we do this whitening step, what we actually do is we make the topics orthogonal to each other. Okay, so this should be intuitively clear if, if it's not mathematically clear. Because if you have a matrix like this, it's low rank, I do a linear transformation to make it the identity, I make these, these means orthogonal. Okay, so, so now this is a much simpler problem to state. Okay, so now the problem I'm going to give to you is a math problem. I've transformed it. Is Here's a set of k-cubed numbers. It has this form. It's the sum of some scalars wi times mu twiddle, mu twiddle, mu twiddle. And the mu twiddles are orthogonal. Okay, so if I hid one of those mu's, I can't hide it now, and you know, I, uh, you just saw wi mu i mu i, and I told you to solve that problem for me where the mu i's are orthogonal, what is that decomposition called? That's just the, uh, yeah, that's just agony. That's the PCA. That's an SVD, because if it's a matrix and I, st I, I tell you, I ask you the question, decompose this matrix into a sum of mu mu transpose, uh, that's just a PCA. Okay, so, so this is really just, we reduce the problem of can we do essentially a PCA on a tensor? That's exactly what this decomposition is. Okay, and so is that, are we good with that? Okay, and Yes, and, and what's one way we characterize the, the, uh, uh, the SVD? Is eigenvectors, because it's a symmetric matrix. Right? So, you know, how do we define, so can we think about eigenvectors of a tensor? So one way to define an eigenvector of a tensor, you know, what's an eigenvector of a matrix? You take the matrix, hit it, hit it by a vector, and you get back the same vector. Okay, so we can just define it you know, the, the eigenvector operation for a tensor as follows. Uh, this is a symmetric tensor, so we can hit the tensor twice by a vector, and all that means is we're just summing out the coordinates, just like when we do a matrix. Yeah. And, and what that looks like here is you just hit this tensor twice by a vector, you sum out the coordinates, you get v dot mu squared times mu twiddle. If it was a matrix, you'd get this. Okay, and the eigenvectors are, of the tensor uh, when you hit it twice with the vector, you get some multiple of the vector. Okay? And the mu's are orthogonal. So what are the eigenvectors of this tensor? 
mu's, right? Because if I put in mu1 here, mu1 dot mu1 is 1, but mu1 dot mu2 is 0. So the only thing that survives is the mu's. And this basically gives you the identifiability proof as well, that uh, it's not too difficult to show that these are the only eigenvectors you're going to get. And the only thing we've needed for this proof to go through is that these topics are linearly independent, which is pretty minor. Um, and, and that's it. So basically, the third moment suffices. We need linear independence. And this problem, at least the single topic case, reduces to just solving the generalized version of a PCA to a tensor over trigrams. Okay, and what about an algorithm? Well, basically, you know, there's, there's various details, but because you're squaring these things, you get much faster convergence than eigenvectors for matrices. Uh, it's so the, this power method kind of thing converges insanely fast. So the algorithm is literally just uh, start somewhere, run the, this power method, you find one guy, and you can, you can kind of deflate in the same ideas, in the same way. And what if you have actual data and not uh, the exact moments? Well, you just plug in, instead of using the exact expectations, use the empirical expectations. And then you run this. It's extremely quick. And you know the, the bottom line is, the algorithm is definitely poly time. The sample size is reasonable. There's various details in you know, doing the, the concentration correctly and the perturbation. But this really is the heart of it. It's really, at that point, it's just turning the crank, the basic idea uh, you've seen. And, and so to, for the theory people here, uh, you know, anytime you, you see tensors, alarm bells should go off because they're typically, typically very hard to deal with. Okay, and why are we saying this problem is easy? It's, it's because these tensors have a special structure. In general, it's very hard to define uh, notions of like eigenvectors and low rank tensors. Uh, this is definitely a, a popular topic in mathematics now. But the point is for the models we tend to use in practice, they tend to have a simple structure, and that leads to a very simple structure in their moments. Uh, and, and that's what we're utilizing here. The, these aren't arbitrary problems we're trying to solve. These higher moments have a particular structure, and that's why this problem is solvable. OK, so so questions about, uh, about this method? So, so the intuition is kind of neat in that what is PCA doing? One intuition is it's trying to find the maximal variance directions in our data. Okay, so what's happening in the topic model case? Uh, we're maximizing the third moment. And it's basically maximizing skewness. You can really formalize that. And that's pretty obvious because what does your topics look like? It's you know, the, the bunch of words that are basically lying on the corners of the simplex. So your data is very pointy, and this algorithm is basically saying, find these pointy directions in your data, and you'll have the property that all local maximizers are exact solutions. That, that's what the eigenvector condition is. It's just essentially a local maximizer to the skewness problem. And that's why we can solve this, even though it's non-convex, because it says every kind of pointy direction is some topic, because it's not convex, but yet, Every local maximizer is good. And this is, you know, I think, reasonable practical intuition for problems anyway, that somehow these very skewed or cartotic directions in our data are the interesting directions. Okay. Yep? Yeah, that's right. So, so this is a, a nice question for LDA as well, because so, this method handles LDA. And LDA, you know, every document might be about five topics. And even there, like, do three words per document suffice? OK, so let's get back to that question. Or for example, what about the mixture of Gaussians problem? Because this is what the second moment looks like. And what does the third moment look like? You're basically going to get, uh, you know, if it was a scalar Gaussian, 
you, you know, say x, forget about the mixture problem, say if x is a mean plus noise, and this is Gaussian noise, the expected value of x cubed is what? It's mu cubed plus 3 the variance times the mean. So you get some extra stuff here. Right. And, and, and it's just going to be more complicated to write it out if, if it's a mixture problem, because these are vectors, but it's clear it doesn't have this simple form. And that's exactly what happens in the, the LDA case as well. When documents contain multiple topics, it's clear your second moment is not going to have this super simple form. OK, so let's figure this out for the mixture of Gaussian's case, and then we'll get some intuition for the topic model case. OK, so, so let's ignore the third moment for now. We see the second moment. What's the variance? It's, it's Furico now. I give you the second moment. Can you tell me the variance from, from this equation, the sigma squared? The smallest eigenvalue, because, uh, yeah. So, but, but intuitively, uh, the, the, you know, what does the data look like? You have, it's varying in some direction based on the means, and then there's going to be, you know, your data basically look like, like this. Just somewhere in high dimensions. We've got the means here, points lying around here, a mean here, and a mean here, and points lying around here. So basically, the smallest eigenvariant, if we look in this direction orthogonal to the, the plane where the means live, the only variance that's coming in this plane is due to the noise. Because the data, because you know, this is mu1, this is mu2, this is mu3. There's sort of no variance due to the, the way the means relate to each other. So, you know, a lot of statement that the, the minimal eigenvalue of this matrix is sigma squared is just that, uh, you know, the smallest direction of variance is sigma squared because we have sigma squared in all directions and the means only lie in some sm lower dimensional subspace. Okay, so we need, you know, k to be slightly bigger, uh, d to be slightly bigger than the number of means, which is minor. Uh, but that can be fixed too. But, but you see we know sigma now, okay? And basically, if we know sigma, how can we get a matrix like this? We just subtract sigma squared i, and then we get a, a matrix of this form. And it turns out for the, the tensor now, it's going to look like a more complicated version of this three sigma squared mu, but that's really just coming from functions of lower order moments. So you can actually just look at the third moment in your data, subtract out some stuff, and get a, a tensor of this form. Because in the scalar case, for the mixture of Gaussians, you get mu cubed plus 3 sigma squared mu. Uh, this is for one Gaussian, but they're going to be sort of interaction terms. It's much messier if, it's much more delicate if the means can be a function, so if the variance is going to be a function of the mean. But if you don't, you just basically get 3 sigma squared mu, subtract that out, because as you told me, we know sigma squared, you know how to estimate the global mean, subtract that out, you can get two things of this form after this manipulation, and you're done. Okay, and that's the general technique for most of the problems we can solve. So this applies to this LDA problem where documents can contain more than one topic, it basically applies to HMMs. You just Futs around with your moments. You look at your moments. They aren't quite as nice as the single topic case, but they're modified in certain ways. And you can just take into account that modification. And geometrically, it's nice too, because now it's no longer the skewness is going to point to the corners. It's going to be slightly off, and you're just correcting for that based on how many uh, topics you think your document has. But the general picture for all these cases we can handle are look at these lower order correlations, manipulate them a bit so we can reduce them to this problem, and this is a problem we can solve through essentially SVDs. Yep, all right. What about correlated topic Yeah, so, so this is a good question. Uh, we're definitely relying on independence. And uh, let me, do I have much more to say? Okay, so let me address that now. So, <laughs> Uh, so the big question is, you know, what kind of things do we want to lean on in our data uh, when we solve these, these, these 
these problems. And this is very much relying on independence and how much would correlation throw you off. And in some settings, correlations could throw you off quite a bit here. Uh, but it's also tricky to start defining these models at some levels once you have correlation if there's too much because you could, you know, at some level, the data could essentially look like there is another topic in that direction anyway if they're correlated. So there's, there's kind of stability questions too. Uh, but let me get back to that in, in the final question because uh, it's actually an important one, sort of what are we leaning on when we actually solve these problems in practice and how brittle or robust they are in different settings. Okay. But the basic thing is, at least the first part, it's kind of just an honest way to look at these problems. We just look at the structure in them, can we reverse engineer it? And it turns out, yes, we can. Okay, and it actually gives some intuition for even harder settings. So HMMs I mentioned, uh, things like PCFGs and uh, latent Bayesian networks, these are much harder problems, but looking at it as, as this inverse moment problem does shed light on things. And, this, and the simplest way is just that this is the type of correlation you expect to see in your data if you're using this model. So just that alone can be enlightening in practice to, to try to see uh, what types of correlations you're going to capture. Uh, but the basic tools can be extended. So, uh, you know, the, there's really one idea here is that these, l looking at these higher moments through the right lens can definitely help us in solving some of these problems. And it does seem like a promising approach. More broadly, you know, this is part of a line of work where I think estimating these kind of hidden variable models are just becoming much less mysterious compared to five years ago. There's been a number of results uh, in different areas. So another line of work is on this sparse coding kind of framework. And there, they basically lean on incoherence. Uh, and, and to some sense, I've been thinking about this a bit and, and talking to people about it, but it seems like we only have about two tricks up our sleeves. And that's independence or incoherence. So here we're using independence, which is, uh, you know, the, these topics are independent uh, of each other because there's only one, one topic per document, or even in the two topic case, it's basically these LDA models have a nice structure. And another thing we can lean upon is incoherence. In instead of assuming strong assumptions about the, the, di the distributional properties of your topics, we can assume the topics or the the vectors in, in our means are incoherent. This is sort of they behave like an orthogonal basis. Uh, and in those settings, I think we can tolerate more correlation, but we have much stronger assumptions on, uh, on the vectors. Because here, all we need is linear independence. And I think it doesn't seem like we have any tools to push the boundaries uh, aside from these two. And practically, th this might be OK as well. I mean, there's a lot of questions sort of what's going on in practice. But I think, you know, compared to five years ago, the world is less mysterious, and to some extent, we either have independence, and actually the ideas from ICA from the 70s apply, or we have incoherence, and then there's been a line of work, uh, sort of starting with Dan Spielman recently, and, uh, you know, Sanjeev and Rang, and various other people, and Praneeth, showing how alternating minimization algorithms uh, can work. And now, you know, but on the other hand, practically I'd say we have much bigger mysteries because uh, the things that are working now, we don't have a good handle on sort of theoretically why. I mean, Shai has been looking at some of this, these questions for neural networks, and he's been essentially trying to attack them by looking at higher moment issues and again seeing we can look at the, the types of correlations that can arise in our data and use uh, he's actually been using tensor stuff too, but it, it's of a different nature. Like he's in the sort of the hard case, not these easy cases. So, uh, so in terms of you know collaborators, uh, it's a bunch of really great collaborators I've worked with. All of this has been with Anima and Daniel, and recently the you know the heavy lifting for the perturbation stuff was done with uh, this postdoc with us, Ron Ge, who's actually the same advisor as Alad. Super uh, terrific uh, postdoc. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot.